This conference will now be recorded. All right, all yours, Rod. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, today is the 23rd of May of 2020, um, and I'm going to do a little bit of uh, the YSA, and then we're going to have two talks. One is about the uh, NIST privacy framework by Michael, Michael Brown, and the other one is Philip Bertlow. Um, and um, we will get started in a little bit. Just wanted to let you guys know that the meetings will continue online. At this point, everybody knows. Um, DEFCON has been canceled. Um, it looks like there's gonna be a bunch of virtual villages. Uh, there is one that recently had a, a summit, which is the Red Team Village. So if you go to redteambillage.io or .com, you can volunteer or submit your talks. They ha obviously, they have to be related to uh, Red Team. There's also some talk about a Blue Team Village. There will be some villages that, that, that will be very active. And there is chatter about an in-person con. It won't, it won't, it obviously, it won't be official. Uh, but I, I've been hearing about a group of people that they're going to show up and they're going to do it. Um, not sure the extent of that, but I, I seen chatter about it. Um, as far as the pandemic goes, we don't really know. Uh, the, the CDC doesn't really seem to know either. Um, we do have a channel where we discuss what's going on, which is the current disaster channel. Uh, we haven't been very off from what's going on and, and what has happened. Um, and uh, um, there's there's a lot of uncertainty, but the, there's one thing for certain: the, the, they decided to reopen. It's uh, and we don't know what's going to happen. I think in the next two or three weeks we will know. Uh, should things continue like this in Florida, we'll probably be looking at August for a comeback on on um, in-person meetings. Uh, I've been told that gyms and uh, other type of uh, in person uh, establishments will be opening in June. Uh, there is right now a several meetings, at least in Miami Dade County. I think probably Broward will open faster, but um, it looks like once they they let the gyms and they let the uh, like martial arts stuff go back, um, it will be you know prudent. I would say to wait a little bit and then we can go back to our to our, uh, our in-person meeting. So I would say, let's, being conservative, we're talking about August, hopefully, you know, people won't start dropping dead left and right. And that's what I'm hoping. And, and if that's the case, that's, that's the month that we're looking to come back. Obviously, this was the month of our con. Con has been canceled. Hope uh, has been canceled as well in New York. Hope is gonna have, I think is uh, nine days. So you may wanna, uh, look around and see what they're planning to do there's a lot of stuff going uh, uh virtually speaking but we'll see uh if things don't don't get as bad and things go sort of like the florida way meaning people just went out and pay attention and it wasn't that bad then i think things would recover quicker um unfortunately the layoffs are starting to hit the industry uh, which is sure about ibm and all their in all their uh companies uh please if you join the Slack, if you send me an email at rod at hackmiami.info or info at hackmiami.org, I will add you to Slack. And there is a channel, job offers. There is plenty of offers right now. Um, and all levels, by the way, contract, um, senior, junior. Um, and because of the COVID, which is the, the, the interesting thing, because of the COVID, you actually have the opportunity to work for companies that would never even consider because of your location. So this this is a silver lining um, in, in what is happening right now. So so please, if you were affected by it, and I know it's coming because I've seen it, uh, it has affected me. I haven't been let go, but but it, it has affected me in some form. And I know friends that have been affected to uh, and starting to be seen in California, which is usually where most of the tech people are. Uh, please uh, keep in touch with us, and uh, if you need anything. To talk to somebody, I know the this whole uh, time being secluded is, is is hard psychologically, and 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 it's important to have a, a, a interaction. We are there, where where there's 24 seven. There's somebody always in the Slack, and we are now testing um, Discord. 
the question, are we moving to this court? I don't know yet. We're going to run this court parallel for a while. Uh, I like the voice stuff and I like the video stuff. If this court proves to be better than Slack, then eventually we'll do a switch. It will be very slow. But if you want to join Discord, let me know. I'm, I'm inviting everybody who wants to at this point uh, move to or, or have both of them. I would suggest you have both of them right now. We ditch um, Keybase. We're not going to use Keybase anymore. And uh, right now, the CPM is being <coughs> the team that we're playing to hack the hack the sack is actually in Discord. So if you go to hack us at uh, 2020 channel in Discord, that's where everything is happening. We were playing yesterday. I play around 1, 1 30 a.m. And there's people still playing. It's, it's, it's a hard city. It's tough. So if you want to learn, please join it. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of fun. And then uh, for more meetings, uh, we are starting to reach uh, our first half. And uh, we're going to have to, I'm going to start reaching out to people because if we're not going to go back yet to in person, we're going to have to, to establish meetings for at least for the foreseeable future. And that will be online. So uh, I will be reaching out to some people. Or if you want to propose a meeting, a uh, presentation of anything, then this is your opportunity. The, the West Coast, part of it, the, the people at, at California are liking the fact that they can see people from the East Coast and vice versa. And same thing with uh, our, our chapter in Spain. So they all have this. This has, this is also another silver lining. This has put us all of us together, and because now we can record everything, everybody can see each other. So there's no more like ah, I wish I could go to California or ah, I wish I could go to Florida. In fact, I think when we go back to in person, it would be great to somehow still record and have some sort of a a, a remote uh, interaction. I don't know how that's gonna be, but but we should try it. And uh, with that, then there's nothing else. This, the, this day, today we have six talks. Uh, two at Hack Miami, uh, two, sorry, five. Two at Hack Miami, two at Pacific Hackers at 4 p.m. EST, 2 p.m. Pacific, um, 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, 5 p.m. Oh, 5 p.m. EST, 2 p.m. Pacific. And then 23 hour Central European time, there's Elena from uh, Hack Madrid, and uh, Hack Barcelona, which is a new chapter from uh, Percent 27 in Spain. Uh, she will be presenting about uh, learning GitHub. So we, we're expanding and uh, we're working on bringing more people over. And, and hopefully in the future, when, when we can go back somehow, we may have a gigantic gathering of all of us from all over the world. We'll see. That's, that's my goal and that's the goal of most of the of all of others that are in other chapters and uh, hopefully that will be achieved at one point. So with that in mind, I'm gonna leave you, who's gonna go first, Phil or Michael? Uh, I don't mind going first. All right, so so Phil is um, is a, uh, an amazing guy that is, you know, play with him at DEF CON. He's He is definitely a good and great operator uh, and I, if I play CTFs, I certainly would like Phil to be part of my team. And I am sure that this presentation is going to be fucking awesome. So with uh, no further ado, Phil, go for it. I appreciate the vote of confidence, Rod. <laughs> uh, hey, guys, I'm Phil. Um, this presentation is on software-defined radio. And um, this is kind of just an introduction to um, Software defined radio, specifically radio in general. Um, and I'm taking the approach of, of someone approaching radio as a hobbyist or uh, if you work in security from a security mindset. Um, so there's a lot that I'm not going to cover. Uh, there's a lot of things I'm just going to scratch the surface on. Um, but I hope this to be kind of just like your introduction. Um, especially if you're interested in radio as a hobby, I hope uh, by the end of this, you'll see that this is a really good introduction. So, who am I? Uh, professionally, I'm a senior security engineer at Vigilant Security. Not really relevant to radio at all. Um, I'm a licensed tech, uh, technician class TAM radio operator since 2018. Um, but most importantly, I'm a hobbyist. Um, and that's really the only qualification that I have coming into radio and really the only one you need to have coming into radio. 
Um, I have been interested in radio since I was a kid, a little story. I remember, uh, must have been like fourth grade, um, someone from our local ham radio club came in to speak to us and it fascinated me. Um, I wanted to learn, you know, how to work with radios, how to do ham radio. And at the time there was a, a requirement to get a, an operator's license that you had to know Morse code. So it always sat in the back of my mind, but I never really knew how to get involved. And it wasn't until years later that I learned about SDR, Software Defined Radio, and the fact that for as little as $20, you can buy a USB dongle off the internet and get access to a huge portion of the RF spectrum. Um, and that moves to my next point, why SDR? Uh, so as I said, it can serve as a really low cost entry into radio as a hobby. Uh, and more importantly, it can expose you to a really large portion of the RF spectrum. So as opposed to maybe entering ham radio the traditional way, which would be to buy a physical radio, which would be limited to, um, uh, you know, a shorter scope of frequencies, a shorter scope of applications. Uh, you can get a Baofeng nowadays, a, a small handheld radio for, for $20, same thing as a, an SDR, but you're really only going to be able to talk on it. Um, and you're limited to the band. So SDR, cheap, really accessible, and it also has a really active community um, and free and open source software. It's going to be really rare that you're going to have to pay for any software related to software defined radio. Um, and I'll talk about all of this stuff later on in this talk, but you'll see the resources are out there to get as, um, to do as basic or as advanced as you want to get. Um, but all of this assumes that you actually care about radio. So let me tell you why should you care about radio? Um, it really lies at the foundation of all telecommunication. Um, you know, most devices that you use today are using radio in one form or another. Your cell phone, uh, cellular networks are UHF. It's just radio. Uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, that's all just radio. Uh, satellite communication, Rod was talking about hack the sat. Those communicate, it's microwave, but it's still radio, KU band, KA band. Um, and all of these concepts are going to be the same underlying all of them. Uh, I also have car key fobs and garage door openers, you know, uh, that's all radio. And so if you're coming from a security background, the OSI model, radio sits at the physical layer, the very foundation. Um, you know, I talk about Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Those are radio and the, the protocols behind them are radio protocols. So understanding them helps you understand the physical layer of a lot of these technology stacks. Um, and additionally, even when it isn't radio, um, let's say you're using something over the wire like Ethernet, the same concepts apply. Digital signal processing, um, whether it's over a wire or over the air, are fundamentally the same. Um, so understanding them gives you a leg up on understanding what's going on at the at the lowest level. But let me give you a little definition of what software defined radio is. Technically, software defined radio is a radio communication system where components that have traditionally been implemented in hardware, stuff like mixers, filters, amplifiers, and modulators and demodulators, are instead implement, and implemented by software. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but Fundamentally, this gives us a lot more flexibility over what we can do. Uh, with the hardware, a traditional full hardware radio, um, you have to build out each part of that radio to your specific purpose, especially your modulators and demodulators. And so like an AM radio and an FM radio are different types of radios. Um, and so they often have both features, but they're fundamentally different circuits. Whereas in uh, software defined radio, um, that demodulating takes place in software. So so there's still hardware involved, but at the end of the road, you're doing things in so software that are traditionally done in hardware. And I have a few graphs here. Oh, let me actually go back. Jump the gun on that one. Um, I'm gonna go into a lot more detail about, oh, did screen sharing stop. Sorry about that, guys. Let me go ahead and switch that up again. All right. So I have a, a diagram of what's called a super heterodyne radio here. I'm gonna go into a lot more detail later on in this talk, but most of these components are still in a software defined radio, still done via hardware. Um, your filters, your amplifiers for your RF and your IF stage are all done by hardware. And it's only really that demodulation step that's done in software. 
So as I said, this gives us a lot more flexibility over what we can do, but it does have some limitations and that mainly has to do with sample rate. Again, I'll go into all of this in more detail later on in the talk, but that's at a high level, what is software defined radio? Uh, also note, this is different from something like uh, from this, like an Uber tooth or a software controlled radio where um, software is involved and it's controlling the radio as it says, but the fundamental components are not being emulated in software. They're still being done in hardware, just controlled by software. So let's talk about a few applications. Um, so software defined radio is a very broad topic. It, it, the applications are everything related to radio, but as a hobby, these are typically the things you're gonna see. So if you buy a software defined radio, one of the simplest things to do is just tune into the radio, AM and FM radio. Uh, right out of the box, it's super simple to do, uh, and it gives you a really quick and easy understanding of radio concepts to be able to do that. Um, and one of the first things you do when, when getting involved in the details of radio is building your own AM radio. It's pretty simple. Um, the other thing you could do, TV tuning. Um, I'll talk later on, but that was the traditional, that's why these USB dongles exist in the first place. They're digital TV tuners that they, people just hacked open to do a lot more than they were originally supposed to do. Um, and so that you can still use them today. Ham radio, Sam gave a great talk a few weeks ago on ham radio. And um, there are a lot of hobbies and different parts of ham radio that, that are kind of different from SDR. It's a subsection, but you can do all of that through ham, uh, through SDR. Uh, you can use a computer as your front end instead of using a physical radio. I can, you know, talk on ham bands with my headset if I wanted. Um, now, a little caveat on that, in certain cases, depending on your SDR, you might need an um converter. Uh, the SDRs, uh, some of them don't natively work work on the frequency of the hand band. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, airplane tracking, ADSB. Um, airplane transponders are radio transponders. They put out messages that you can pick up and a lot of the flight tracking that's done is by uh, people just, just making their own Raspberry Pi. Um, you see in the corner here in this image, a Raspberry Pi with an RTL SDR. You can do that to pick up flight trackers and uh, FlightAware actually sells packages to do that yourself. Um, if you go on FlightAware today, you'll see who's who's providing that data. Um, NOAA weather satellite imagery. That's the actual image that you see up here on this slide. Um, there are satellites in space that are taking pictures and then just beaconing out over radio images of them. And you can decode that stuff. It's actually a really fun hobby to do. And then the last one I wanted to mention is fox hunting. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this too, but it's basically hunting down the source of where a radio broadcast is coming from. Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the scope of the government doing it, but you as a hobbyist can track down signals um, and using a computer is one of the best ways because you have to bring in information from multiple radios and plot it on a map. And it's hard to do that without a computer. Uh, so those are just some of the things you can do, uh, but this wouldn't be Hack Miami if I didn't talk about some of the malicious applications. Now, I'm going to be going into the le legality of all of this in length, but um, you know, let's talk about some of these. So the simplest would be jamming. Um, super illegal, but it's basically just shouting louder than everyone else. Um, if you can put out noise on a frequency band, it can make it difficult for anyone trying to use that band to, to, to receive what they want to do. And it's a pretty you know easy thing to do. Um, also, as I said, I mentioned fox hunting. You will get caught if you do it. Uh, static code replay attacks, um, pretty simple in, in some very simple applications. Um, the, the protocol is just a static code that goes off. Um, a really good example of this is I was able to um, reverse engineer our, our doorbell at our office. It uses a static code. You record, you just record that signal and play it back and the doorbell rings. Um, and so you'd be surprised how many devices are vulnerable to a static code attack. Um, getting more complicated, uh, protocol attacks. This is basically like any vulnerability. This, this, this is more specific to how the protocol is implemented. And I'm going to be showing a few videos with examples in a moment um, of a forward key fob attack. So this attack really has to do with the specific implementations. Forward fixed this, um, but I just kind of put them under an umbrella of implementation attacks, protocol attack. Uh, another relay attacks. Um, so near field radios, uh, if you can extend them, I'm going to be showing another example of how a Tesla was stolen via relaying uh, the key fob. It's another simple attack. And then spoofing. This is probably the scariest ones. Uh, a, a lot of radio protocols work on faith. 
work on good faith that you're that you are who you say you are and so airplane transponders just like we can receive them you can send them out and you can lie about who you are and i'm going to be showing a pretty scary example of that too um so here we go let me see if i can get this to work uh, i'm going to be trying to use my mic to pick up my laptop speakers but here's an example of uh, the four key fob attack from hack five i'm going to lock the vehicle so don't touch anything so i locked it Okay, and now, because I know you really want to get in there, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll work on seeing if maybe we can get in the vehicle or be able to get in there through some other means. Okay, so we'll work on doing that, set a couple things up. Oh, there you go. Oh, well, thank you so much. So uh, the video might have been a little choppy there, but basically what they're showing is that you can use one of these off the shelf radio hardware. Um, and at the time, I believe Ford has fixed this, but at the time he can use this to attack a key fob and unlock a car um, maliciously. Pretty scary stuff. Uh, here's another one. This is the Tesla attack. Audio doesn't really matter here, but what you're seeing is uh, two thieves coming up to a car at night. It's a Tesla. Uh, one of them has a backpack with an antenna and the other thief is going to the car. And what they're basically doing is just relaying uh, the key fob signal. So when you get close to a Tesla, it picks up your key fob and unlocks and starts the car. Well, they're basically just using an antenna to, to hop that over to the car. And the car thinks that you're that you're there. And so there it is, 30 seconds. Uh, come up to a car, pick it up, drive off. And then this is probably the scariest example I have on here. Now, let's see how well this is going to work. But this is, um, let me set this up a little bit. This is spoofing ADSB transponders. Now, this was done in a very controlled environment. but Earlier in this talk, this is taken from DEF CON 20 in 2012, uh, they showed that you could spoof airplane transponders. And they, they talk about how even though air traffic control has primary radar, they don't use it a lot of time. And they actually rely on these transponders as their primary source of information. So if you were to do this, air traffic control and other planes would see this in real time. Have a little video here. Google Earth's display, that is the output from the real world uh, ADSB receiver, the real world traffic. The virtual plane there at the bottom is the ADSB data stream out. Now, this is done under very controlled conditions, basically dummy load, you know, two radios connected to each other. It wasn't actually put out into the air. But, as you can see, So just to explain what's going on here, you see, okay, we've got real plane there, VDR, you know, 211, everything. Those are the real flights. Your mom is not the real flight. <laughs> Your mom might be like a 747, but, you know, that's not her. You see, it's got, you know, valid packets, valid information. And I'm not I can't tell if it's showing up on the displays or not. Um, okay, so as you can see the flight path as he's uh, turning around there over the bay. I'll skip ahead here. Basically, he buzzes the tower. And this is all just to show you that a lot of these protocols are relying on just the assumption that you don't have access to this technology. And you could, if you want to do a lot of damage, um, now you'll get caught, as I'm going to explain in a second, but you're technically feasible. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, legality around this and regulators and frequency allocation. Um, so there's two main bodies that are important to this. Uh, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, they're a part of the UN. They're like any UN organization, more about inter-country um, matters. Uh, what's more important to us is the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission. And they are the ones who regulate the um, frequency space. Um, and so they control and allocate frequencies from nine kilohertz to 275 gigahertz. And you can see the map on here. Obviously you can't read anything, but look it up if you're interested on what they allocate each one of these frequency spaces for. And let's talk a little bit about how they allocate that. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, it's, it, it, each, each space is allocated by a use but you also have users. So you have spectrum licenses, um, cellular networks. You'll often hear about spectrum auctions that happen. One happened, I believe happened in 2008, um, where they auction off a large part of, of spectrum to a specific provider uh, who is going to be using that. So 
Verizon, AT&T, they auction for uh, spectrum space. The other thing is uh, another spectrum license called a broadcast license. This is probably what you're a lot more familiar with, AM, FM radio stations, TV radio stations. They have their call signs and stuff like that. Uh, they're allowed to broadcast in a certain frequency space, but uh, only geographically, only in a certain place. And then you have something called the universal license system. Um, People like ham radio operators who get call signs, they are a part of this, airplanes, boats, uh, and then uh, general mobile radio service is another one. Um, all of these you have to register with the FCC. You're not given exclusive uh, use of a, of a spectrum space, but you're allowed to be a user on there. You just have to register and identify yourself. And so as a ham radio operator, when I register, I have to give my address. And so that's why I don't give my call sign all the time is because you could find out where I live just from my call sign. And then the other one is unlicensed bands. Now that doesn't mean unregulated. There are still, you know, rules uh, regarding what you can do on these bands, but you don't have to register with the FCC to transmit on these bands. Um, CB radio is a good example. Um, FRS, Family Radio Service, and then the one that we really care about, which is the Industrial Scientific and Medical Bands, ISM bands, and I'll talk at length about those in a little bit. One note, uh, just talking about the, that ham radio operator, uh, the universal licensing system allows you to look up the call sign of anyone. Um, in this case, this is a famous astronaut. I'm not giving away any, you know, information that isn't already out there. But, um, you know, by your call sign, you can find out who and where they're broadcasting from. Um, and so you have to register. Enforcement. Uh, I talked a little bit about fox hunting before. Um, the FCC regularly monitors RF space. Uh, they have vans uh, that are, you know, decked out with RF equipment that can monitor a lot of, you know, transmissions and they, they commonly hunt down pirates. And so this is a warning, don't transmit on a band you're not supposed to. The FCC will find you and they will find you. Um, so while technically you can get into a lot of trouble, people are watching and they will come find you. Uh, so just keep that in mind. So the ISM bands, um, industrial scientific and medical bands, uh, these are portions of the radio spectrum that are intentionally left open, uh, mostly because there are other sources of frequencies in these spectrums that uh, they can't really control. Uh, for example, your microwave gives off uh, 2.4 gigahertz. It's why that part of the spectrum is open. And so they acknowledge that, you know, we need to have microwaves. There's going to be uh, noise in that part of the spectrum. So they opened it up and basically said, Listen, you can use that spectrum for what you want. Just be, an, you know, acknowledge that there's going to there's potentially a lot of noise there. So you have to be susceptible to interference from other devices. But this is why a lot of applications are up there because you don't have to register with the FCC. Now, I say register. I'll show you in a second. You still have to be tested uh, that your device isn't putting out other stuff. So you still have to kind of register with the FCC, but they don't need call signs for every single device that goes out there. So Wi-Fi works over uh, 2.4 gigahertz. It also works over five gigahertz. You'll notice here the entire five gigahertz band isn't covered. And so this these applications don't exclusively work over these bands, but historically they did for just ease of use. Uh, but you'll find a lot here. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, cordless phones, if anyone remembers what those are. Uh, garage door openers, baby monitors. Um, the nice thing and why this is important to us is these, we have a lot more freedom over these bands. Um, since they're unlicensed, you can transmit with some, you know, there are some restrictions, but you can, you can play around on these bands without having the FCC come knock down your door. I talked about a little bit about the ID lookup. So uh, these devices do need to be registered with the FCC so that they can check that they're not putting out anything they're not supposed to. But that gives us uh, a really useful resource, especially as hackers. If you want to see what frequency a device is giving off, let's say, find your key fob for your, your car or your garage door opener and turn it around. You will find one of these IDs. And you can go on the FCC's website and look up uh, what frequency does it operate on. And they even have in this detailed exhibits page, you know, a lot of the time they'll have the user's manual in there. That is really useful some of the times for, for you know, finding information, useful information about a device just from the ID on the back. Um, so most of what I've been saying about legality is about transmitting, and that's really where you have to be careful with radio, but that doesn't mean there are no regulations around around receiving. Generally, you're okay about receiving stuff, but there are a few caveats. So there's something called the Interception and Divulgence of Radio Communications Act. 
um, basically says that you can't use radio to your own benefit. And uh, they give a few examples. Taxi cab company intercepting radio communications from a rival dispatcher to get an advantage. Uh, intercepting like un unencrypted TV signals and reselling it. Um, recording people's, you know, conversations over radio and trying to use that to your advantage. Stuff like that. Uh, also, it's illegal to decrypt anything that's encrypted. If there is encrypted communication, don't try and decrypt it. That is illegal. Any communication that is encrypted, it is illegal to try and decrypt if you're not authorized to. Um, a note about this, uh, if you're a ham radio operator, it is, you're not allowed to encrypt any of your communications. That's part of being a ham radio operator. So uh, you likely won't see a lot of encryption, but if you do, don't try and crack it because you can get in trouble for it. Um, I'm going to go over a few basics of radio concepts that are important. So a lot of you might already know a lot of this stuff, uh, basic trigonometry stuff, sine waves. Um, there are three main aspects to a sine wave. You have its amplitude, right? Uh, in, in this case, it's how much power it measured in dB. Uh, you have its frequency, you know, the period at which it goes over. Um, and you have its phase. Phase is a little bit more complicated, but it's basically just where it is relative um, you know, the shift of the wave. Um, these are the three aspects of a sine wave that are important. And when we get to modulations, these are basically the three places that you can encode data with. Uh, but they are all important concepts. Uh, another one in SCR is called the Fourier transform. This is a mathematical concept that you can take any complex waveform and decompose it into its simple waveforms. Um, and so waves will interfere constructively and destructively. And you'll see this wave up here at the top, it's kind of messy, but any messy waveform like that can be decomposed into a series of simple waveforms. Um, this is a really, really powerful concept in radio. Um, you'll see it a lot here. I have two images up here of an FFT plot of a, where you can see kind of, instead of the waveform itself, you can see what are the frequencies that make it up. And another picture here at the top left, which is a waterfall plot. And those are those frequencies over time. So this is one of the big powerful uses of, of uh, software-defined radio is of giving you this kind of broad view of the radio spectrum over time and over frequencies. Uh, let's talk about a few radio components. Um, we talked about amplitude. An amplifier is something that just increases the amplitude. Um, in a lot of cases, it's you know all frequencies, but if you pass it through a filter, it's some frequencies. And it, it, it's just a simple idea. It, you're just, you should be, you know, we all know what an amplifier is. It increases, you know, sound on a radio um, or on your speakers. You're just turning up the volume. Filters. Um, we talked about it, uh, a Fourier transform, about how you can spread out uh, your frequencies. Filters just block out some of those frequencies. So you have a low pass filter, um, which lets all of the frequencies below a certain threshold. High pass filter lets all the frequencies above a certain threshold. And your uh, band pass or band stop filters, which basically just, they allow either a certain portion of frequencies or reject a certain portion of frequencies. Some basic ideas, but they're they're powerful. And then you have a, a mixer, which is uh, basically just a, an oscillator. You create a simple waveform and you add it to another waveform. Um, so it's basically just adding together two waveforms. And this is often used to uh, shift a frequency. So you can, um, I'll, I'll explain in a little bit uh, about a super heterodyne radio and why this is so powerful. Before I get there, though, I want to make um, I want to talk about baseband and carrier waves. So, um, a baseband refers to the actual data that you carry care about. Uh, in terms of audio, that would be the speech, uh, the actual you know audio that I'm making. And for human voice example, for human hearing, that's around 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. But there's a problem. Um, Radio waves at that low of a frequency are really difficult to deal with. Your antennas are going to be huge. It's just, it's very cumbersome. So what we want to do is we want to take this, this lower frequency information, in this case audio, and encode it onto a higher frequency waveform that we can transmit. And so for example, AM radio functions at around 500 to uh, 1500 kilohertz. Um, and through modulation, we can take this information and encode it onto a carrier. And so we see here uh, two examples. One is of analog mod modulation and another of digital. I'll get more in detail about different types of modulation later. But the basic idea is that you're, you're 
you're encoding one piece of information on another and one carries it. So with all of that out of the way, let's talk a little bit more in detail about how a software defined radio works. Um, and more generally, a uh, software defined radio is just a, a, a uh, super heterodyne radio, which most radios are. So what is a super heterodyne radio? The basic idea behind it is that you want to be able to tune and isolate a, a single frequency or range of frequencies, a band of frequencies. And this makes sense. Think about a, an FM radio. You have a dial and you can turn it to the station you want. And you only hear that one station and there are multiple stations side by side. That's the basic idea. Um, now we could do this by having a dynamic filter, having a filter that has the ability to change which frequencies it filters out. But those are expensive, they're complicated to make. What makes a lot more sense is to have a, a, a filter that works for a specific range of frequencies is fixed and to use a mixer as we talked about to shift the incoming frequency around that fixed filter. Um, and this is how most radios work. Um, and so we can see back to this diagram, the super heterodyne receiver, and I'm, I'm gonna show in more detail how this works, but this this screenshot, by the way, is a screenshot of the HackRF, showing that in, in, in hardware is implemented these components. So let me go to the next page. We can see that we have the antenna up here at the top, at the top right, we have an antenna and a whole mix of frequencies. Um, the first thing we do is we're going to filter out a certain range. There are some technical details I'm not getting into why you have to do this called an image, but we start with one filter and filter it down into what are called the intermediate frequencies. We then shift these down and this is the movement that I was talking about that moves the frequencies we care about to the frequencies that the filter works at. And you can see here, the second filter is filtering out just the one frequency. So through these three steps, we go from the entire radio spectrum down to just the one frequency that we care about. And as I said, this is how most radios work and specifically software defined radios. And so in this diagram on the left, um, this is showing an analog radio. In the case of an SDR, this part right here called the product detector and the beat frequency oscillator, this is just what's doing demodulation for an AM uh, radio. This would be implemented in software, but the rest of this picture, just like in a normal radio, is all going to be done in hardware, uh, though it's controlled by software. There's another really important concept, and this really comes to the heart of software-defined radio, and that's the idea of sampling. Um, what we've been talking about is analog signals, but uh, a computer works on digital information, and the difference between that is one is continuous and one is discrete. Uh, and what does that mean? That means a radio signal has a value at literally every single point. You can zoom in further and further in time and it's gonna have a value there. But computers work in discrete chunks. Um, you have a clock speed on your computer, you know, 2.5 gigahertz, five gigahertz, whatever it is, it's working at a certain frequency. Um, and when it comes to uh, digital signal processing, you have what's called an analog to digital converter, which basically just takes a measurement at a certain frequency in time. And you can see here, you come in with a continuous signal and what comes out is a measurement at a certain time. And so it gives us a good approximation of that wave, but it's an approximation and that comes with some caveats. And this next page is gonna show one of, of one of those examples. So there's an issue in uh, software defined radio or any digital signal processing called aliasing. And that's what happens when you're trying to sample something at too slow of a rate for the frequency. So at the top, we can see a wave that's being sampled at, at a proper sample rate. We're getting enough information to properly show what the wave would look like. And we can see that by each one of these circles where this line, the sample interval, intersects the, the, the wave, we get a value. But if that frequency is too high, we're gonna get a bad image of, of what that, free, uh, that waveform looks like. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. I think my headset just turned off. So um, the point about this is that you have to have your sample rate match your frequency. Otherwise you're gonna get some artifacts and it is gonna confuse your whole system by making it think that uh, a different waveform is coming in that's actually coming in. 
another important concept in software defined radio is called in phase and quadrature, also called IQ. Um, this is a pretty complex idea, but simply the idea is that you take a single waveform and you turn it into two. Um, you duplicate it and shift one 90 degrees out of phase. The reason this is done is uh, twofold. Uh, one phase of a wave, or at least when doing phase modulation, it's incredibly difficult to tell uh, what the phase of a wave is. And two, uh, doing this makes modulating signals a lot easier. So it's a complex idea. I'm not going to get too into it, but just keep in mind that signals uh, come in when software defined radio come in as two values, an I and a Q. Um, and it's mainly just done for convenience sake. Um, and then we get to a really important concept modulation. Um, so I spoke before about the different aspects of a sine wave, uh, amplitude, frequency, and phase. These are the three attributes you have to work with when you want to encode information in radio signals. Um, the baseband, the information you want to encode, is either going to come in one of two forms. It's either going to be analog, uh, audio, like this is analog or digital, um, which, you know, we have examples here in this picture of analog and digital waveforms. Um, and, and each one of these comes different forms of modulation. So for amplitude, you have amplitude modulation. Um, when you have a, a, a an analog signal in and an analog carrier, what you get looks like this result on the bottom left. Um, and so as time goes on, your amplitude goes up and your amplitude goes down, and that change in amplitude is where our information is. Now, when we get to digital information, we have what's called shift keying. And in the case of amplitude, it's called amplitude shift keying. Um, there are multiple types of it. One is called on-off keying. This is going to be the most uh, common example. And I'm going to show uh, examples of these in a little bit. But it's basically, is there a signal or is there not a signal? And that encodes our information. Uh, we can do the same with frequency. We can do frequency modulation either with an analog signal or frequency shift key. And we can do the same thing with phase. Now, that's not as easy to show here, but the point stands. We can encode information by varying any of these attributes. Um, and we can do it either with analog information or digital information. And then something that I'm not going to get too much into, but it's important, talking about IQ, there's something called quadrature modulation. Now, you're still working with these three basic parameters, amplitude, frequency, and phase, but you're doing it through your IQ samples. Um, this is important because stuff like Wi-Fi works over quadrature amplitude modulation. Um, I might get into that more in a future talk, but just keep in the back of your mind that, that for advanced technologies like Wi-Fi, that is the modulation type that's used. Um, and then there's an important concept here, which is the idea of bit rate and error rate. Um, so going on to the next page, I have an example here at the bottom that when doing shift keying, you can have it be binary, either uh, a zero or a one, or you can encode more information um, by choosing different steps. So we can here in these bottom two examples, um, you can either have a signal on or off, or you could have a signal at one, 0.5 or zero. And so how many intervals of frequency uh, of, ampli um, of amplitudes you use will give you how many how many bytes uh, how many bits you can fit in there. But the trade-off for that is that there's a possibility of error rate. So it's a lot easier to tell if your radio is on or off versus is it at 100% power, 50% power or 0% power. So there's a trade-off between your bit rate and your error rate. Just keep that in mind. And so here on the screen, I have uh, a little bit of an example between um, amplitude shifting and frequency shifting. Actually, this is not frequency shifting. I'm sorry. This is frequency modulation. But these are examples of different modulation schemes and how they appear in the waveform. So with all of that, let's talk a little bit about uh, hardware and, and the kinds of hardware that's out there for consumers. Um, there's a few things that you need to be mindful of when picking a software-defined radio. Um, chipset is important. Um, there are multiple DSPs uh, and, and ADACs, uh, analog to digital converter chipsets out there. Um, I'll talk about a few of them, but the most important reason it's important is the drivers related to them is going to dictate what the kind of software you can use. So just keep that in mind. Um, uh, in, in some cases, the chipset for the analog to digital converter is separate from the tuner. 
Uh, I'll show that with the RTL SDR, but just keep in mind the tuner, at least the hardware components, as we talked with the Super Heterodyne receiver, those front parts, the RF and the IF stage, could be separate from the, the software-defined radio chipset. Um, and that will dictate, you know, your frequency range and stuff. And so the chipset for the, the DSP is going to dictate your sample rate and the, the chipset for your tuner is going to dictate your frequency range. Also keep in mind um, the difference between receiving and transmitting. Um, you know, the RTL SDR right here only does receiving. It's $20, but you can only receive. You're going to need something more expensive like a Hack RF or a Blade RF if you, if you want to do transmission. Um, and when it does come to transmitting, there's a difference between half duplex and full duplex. And basically what that means is whether you can transmit and receive at the same time or not. Um, uh, and then here's the big, the two big ones that are, are really going to dictate the price between SDRs is the noise and the clock. Um, noise, how susceptible it is to noise, how well it's built, how well every part is built to be susceptible to noise is going to dictate how weak of a signal you can receive. Um, for a lot of applications to get into it, it's not gonna matter too much. Digital digital um, protocols can kind of deal with noise, but as you get higher into the hobby, that's, you know, getting your noise down is where, where it gets expensive. And then the other one is your clock. Um, having a consistent clock, especially at very high frequencies, you know, having a, a, a oscillator that shifts and isn't perfect is gonna have an effect. And so as you get, you know, up there in price, um, you're gonna have, better tempered um, oscillating crystals that just keep the time better. And then a really important thing, this isn't really about the hardware uh, of, the, uh, of the SDR, but of the entire setup that you have. Be mindful that your USB interface matters a lot. Um, and this really comes into play when you're dealing with VMs. Trying to do software-defined radio through a VM is asking for trouble. Um, there, you're just adding extra, you know, links in the chain, and I, just from experience, have had trouble with it. So try and do it on bare hardware, and be mindful that the difference between USB 2 and USB 3 in, in certain applications will matter. Um, so with that, uh, let's get a little bit into the history of it. So this really started with the RTL-SDR. Um, the RTL-2832 chipset made by Realtek was built to demodulate TV signals. Um, they originally just built it as a TV tuner. Um, but they also added a mode to be able to do um, uh, RF, uh, sorry, um, um, FM radio, and they did it through IQ samples. And while one of the Linux developers was developing drivers for this device, he discovered that this device was capable of a lot more than what they marketed for. So it could do more than just TV and FM radio. It could do a huge range of frequencies, and they unlocked them. This is really what sparked the consumer SDR craze. Um, is the RTL SDR and unlocking this chip. Now, since then, a lot of chips have come out, but this is really the granddaddy of them. And um, especially when you talk about compatibility, uh, a lot of software supports specifically this chipset and, and the drivers around it. So a little bit about that. Uh, sample rates are capable of up to about 3.2 million samples per second. You'll see uh, sample rates sometimes in samples per second, sometimes in Hertz. They're basically interchangeable. Um, realistically, you're talking about 2.8 uh, million samples per second or about 2.8 megahertz of a sample rate. Um, frequency, again, uh, this is just the chipset, and so you'll see a lot of the time the actual tuner that goes along with this will change depending on who's producing these devices. And I've listed a few of the most common ones, but you'll see the frequency ranges change in some point as much as double the high end uh, frequency that you can reach in some cases is double so be mindful of that when you when you go out and buy um, SDRs you might see these two chipset numbers uh, RTL 2832 you know um, e4000 that's what that's referring to so this is a really common implementation rtlsdr.com is a really great resource uh, but they also make their own implementation of this device and i've highlighted a few um sdrs here just to give you an example of what they're capable of this one very interesting i didn't actually know this until i did research for this presentation they're capable of going down to uh ht bands or sorry hf bands meaning you could do ham radio with this out of the box really nice um i that didn't used to be the case and i don't think that's an uh you know a standard feature of these but very nice um it is receive only um a few other things 8-bit iq samples 
uh, USB 2 and it has an SMA adapter. That RTL SDR is very similar to this. This is my first um, SDR that I bought years ago and it has a different connector on it. But a lot of these are capable of, of very similar things. But the point is, this is probably where you want to start. They're 20 to $25, a really great entry into SDR. Going up a little bit more, uh, you have the HackRF1. Um, this is made by Great Scott Gadgets. Uh, this is a really great device too. What's really nice about this is it allows for transmission as well. It is half duplex, but it does allow for transmission. Um, the range on these is about 30 megahertz to 6 gigahertz, so a uh, higher in the high end, allowing for uh, Wi-Fi frequencies. Um, but you can't go down to the ham frequencies, at least not with a, an up converter. Um, USB 2, uh, SMA connector. Also, this one's about $300. Uh, another common um, SDR is called the Blade RF. Uh, has a probably the best uh, range of them all, but it's also the most expensive. This allows for full duplex. It has a higher sample rate. Uses USB three. Um, the cool thing about this is it has four antennas. Um, so there's a lot you can do with these devices. Now I'm just scratching the surface here. I'm going to throw out a bunch of other uh, SDRs here that run the gamut. You can see at the top the Flex 6600. That's like a serious ham radio SDR. Those things start at five thousand dollars. So you can you can really go up in range. Um, but those things are are well built, low noise noise floor, um, really capable. Uh, you'll see FlightAware sells their own device that is uh, specifically targeted to ADS-B. Um, New Electric, I have one of those right here. Um, great device, but also has different drivers, so your, your compatibility. So there's a lot of options out there. Just be mindful that they all have their caveats. Um, let's talk a little bit about software. What am I doing on time? Ugh, let me speed it up a little bit. Um, software. So there's a lot of options. Um, one of the basic ones is GNU Radio. Um, this is really kind of low level. You're, you're talking about implementing your own components in software, but if you want to learn radio concepts, this is a really great place to start. Um, and you can do basically anything you want to in radio. So uh, the screenshot here is actually one that I built. This is um, an FM receiver. Um, and, and it's showing, you can see low pass filter in here. You can see, uh, you know, tuners and, and, and syncs. Uh, and one of the really great parts about this is you can debug while you're working. So you can see GUI syncs in all throughout here. This allows me to see at each stage of this radio, what does the waveform look like? And it's a really good tool for learning about radio and uh, digital signal processing. But let's say you don't want to get down in the weeds. Um, your best bet and probably the place to start is with SDR Sharp or HD SDR. Um, these are out of the box applications that allow you to do most of what you're going to want to do. Uh, FM radio, AM radio, lower side band, upper side band. Um, these are your more out of the box tools that, that will allow you to interface a lot easier. Uh, there's a lot of settings on them. You have a lot of capabilities, um, but you're not literally putting together components like you are on GNU Radio. And then you also have applications that are kind of just out of the box. Um, you don't really have to know much about radio. You just set them up in their applications. Um, FlightAware, ADSB is a really good example. They sell packages with a Raspberry Pi and a, um, you know, a USB dongle that you just set up and you start feeding them uh, flight tracking data. And you can monitor them yourselves. The, the, the cool thing too is um, the HackRF one has, or at least the Portapack, has uh, firmware to do this out of the box. So it's a, it's a cool thing that you can just get up and going without really having much knowledge. And, and you know, another cool thing: NTSC decoder. Um, so analog video, uh, you can decode it uh, pretty easily over using a computer. So this is something fun to play with. Um, yeah, I don't know where you're going to find analog TV signals other than hand bands anymore. I don't think they put out analog TV signals anymore. Um, but if you find them, you can decode them. And then one of the cooler ones is a uh, NOAA weather satellite imagery. So, um, for example, this is actually levering, leveraging SDR Sharp, um, but feeding that information into a program called WX to Image. Um, and as you can see, they're they're receiving a radio signal and decoding into an image. Um, and there's just a lot of cool stuff that you can do out there. There's a lot of good tutorials and free software to to play around with all of this stuff.
And then one of the coolest things um, are programs like Universal Radio Hacker and Spectrum. And these are applications that can assist you in demodulating signals. So if you have frequency shift keying or on off keying out in the wild and you find those and you, you capture those signals, you can bring them into these programs to help you assist figuring out, okay, what is the modulation scheme here? Um, and, and actually extracting the information. I've been playing around with this recently to decode my garage door opener, to actually get the bits coming off of it from, um, from the waveform. That actually brings me to uh, the future. Um, in the future, I want—I didn't have time to cover it in this talk, but I want to dive deeper into a lot of the concepts that were uh, brought up here. Uh, digital signal processing concepts and radio theory. More importantly, I want to demo GNU radio. Um, I want to show you how to build an AM radio out of components. And I want to show you how to use uh, programs like Universal Radio Hacker and Spectrum to find, um, find devices out in the wild and reverse engineer how they work. Um, because as you know, security researchers, that's what we want to do. And as a last page, uh, just a few additional resources if you guys want to go off and learn a little bit more on your own. Um, great Scott Gadgets, the maker of the HackRF1, has some really great resources. Michael Osman is uh, amazing, has given some really good talks um, at DEF CON and other cybersecurity conferences on software-defined radio and has um, a really good video series on his website for free that will teach you a lot of the radio concepts and get you up and going with things like a new radio. I definitely recommend you check them out. Uh, the other one is a three volume series called Field Expedient SDR. Physical books, if you like to have physical books in your hand, it's a really great introduction to SDR. Um, a lot of radio books that are out there are super technical in the radio theory, and this is a really great way of getting your hands dirty. Uh, it walks you through how to set up the new radio and actually understand all these concepts. Uh, it's what I read in, in preparation for this talk. And then a few more, um, rtlsdr.com has great tutorials on basically everything I talked about today. Uh, Reddit has an RTLSDR subreddit, which also has some really good information. And just another call, uh, you know, call out to uh, Sammy Kamkar. He's a security researcher, but does work with uh, software defined radio. Check him out, Google him. He's got some really good talks. And with that, that's all I've got. So, uh, Rod, I don't know if you want to do it now, but I guess we can open up the, the question for floors, or if you if, if you want to wait until uh, both presentations are over to do that. Well, thank you, Phil. I was actually going to ask if anybody has any questions. They are welcome to unmute themselves and uh, ask away, if that's all right. It was a very thorough presentation and I uh, <laughs> had to be out for a little bit of it, but I will be listening to the rest of it. That was excellent. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Got a little into the weeds. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right, All right, Rod, do you have anything or do we just make uh, Michael? Michael, you ready? Let's go for it. All right. Two secs, please. Da -da -da. Poof, you are the presenter. Okay. All right. Make sure you share which screen you want. Yep. We can see the PowerPoint. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Later. Okay. Have a great presentation. Okay. Thank you. I hope uh, everyone can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Michael Brown. I think hopefully most of you guys are, are aware of who I am. Uh, we've probably met at past meetings. So the focus of this talk is to talk about the new privacy framework that has come from NIST. And you know, we'll probably talk a little bit about privacy. And I think probably I should probably preface that with, you know, we're all security professionals here. And some of you are probably thinking like, well, I, I'm into security. I don't really care about privacy. Why should I care? And so on and so forth. And honestly, you know, I'm almost in the same boat. I, I consider myself a security professional, been working in security for quite a while. Um, but in the last few years as a security consultant, I have found myself more and more pulled over or have to be involved in, in privacy matters. And honestly, for myself, I'm getting to the point where, you know, I know I need to get more knowledgeable about privacy. Um, and I think that's, that, that's something that I think other other out of us in our security community need to do the need to do the same thing. Uh, we need to be more mindful of 
you know, the related field of privacy. Uh, some of the stuff that we are doing will probably pull us into privacy. So better to take advantage of it and find out more than be on the uh, back end of the curve. Um, so a little bit of background on myself for those of you who aren't too familiar with me and my experience. So I found this cute little cartoon. I have a few others in the presentation, you know, the privacy train wreck. Uh, I, I love some of the things they had here. I have over, they have here over the side here, the, the privacy officer, I warned you all. Uh, that seems to be the, 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 the bane of people, you know, privacy officer, security officer, you know, trying to, trying to get the company to go in the right direction. And down at the bottom here, we got the, cons the consultant going, oh, I'll clean up the mess. And that's, that's somehow, that's someone, someone that's me. Uh, trying to kind of help out our clients and help them the right way. But, you know, this is the thing. I also was trying to look for some kind of a presentation, you know, kind of a slide on, you know, stats for privacy breaches and wasn't really able to find a really good one. But the thing to, to, to keep in mind is that, you know, we've had a lot of these really big data breaches in the last few years. And in many cases, a lot of them are breaches of privacy. It's breaches of, of privacy data. Um, and that's something that we need to be mindful of. So what we're going to do, like that, we're going to do some, you know, look, look into some of the definitions, talk do a little bit about privacy regulations. We can, we can, you can spend whole hours talking about them. Touch on on this. Uh, I think I should talk a little bit about what the, the cybersecurity framework is, and then go into the privacy framework itself. And then I always like to wrap things up, you know, again similar with Philip's presentation of resources that, you know, give you some pointers and where, you know, directions for where you want to go next in learning more about this subject. So I think first off, you know, again, it's in front of helping guys understand is like, you know, what we talk about, when we talk about personal data information. So some terms you might hear, you might hear the term PHI, um, which stands for protected health information, not, not um, personal health information. That's basically, that's the, term for basically medical records. You know, you go to your doctor, you go to a hospital and all that medical information they create for you is called PHI, all has to be protected. You know, if you get into kind of the legalese, you know, there's like 18 identifiers that some combination constitutes PHI. And basically it's anything that can identify a person and a medical condition, that's PHI, and it could be like just two or three of those 18. It doesn't have to be all of them, but it could be things like, oh, hey, here's a lab result on someone. Oh, and we know who that person is. We know the lab results, and that gives us information. Or, oh, I got this slide of an X-ray, and oh, it's got a person's name on it, and so identifiers, and so on and so forth. Uh, PII is more broadly as personally identifiable information. That's basically, again, the same thing. Information that can identify an individual. You know, some combination of social security number, phone number, address, you know, and so forth. And then there's an even broader thing of, of personal data. What do you mean by personal data? It's all kind of data about you that you may or may not want people to know, but, you know, it's oftentimes being, being gathered. This is anything from what do you like to buy? You know, what do you like to listen to? What's your favorite movies and TV shows? Um, where, do you, where are you going on vacation? And some people are like, oh, that's, that's no big deal, um, except that this is all information about you and that's information that other people can make use of for good or bad. Yeah, and maybe some of you guys have experienced this, but I've seen this. In fact, I had this, you know, something, you know, good illustration of this recently where to help out one of my clients, I went over, I was doing some research online, you know, doing a Google search, looking up things about, you know, website accessibility, which is basically making sure websites are accessible people with, with various physical handicaps. After doing that, I went over to YouTube to watch, you know, a video and guess what happened to me? I had an ad pop up for a law firm, you know, for like, oh, how you can protect yourself for lawsuits if your website isn't accessible for people with handicap. It's like, what the heck? I'm over here on Google, do a search, go over to Yahoo. And somehow Yahoo knows that I was searching that and was giving me an ads. And I'm sure some of us have seen this where, you know, we could do a search on some item or what have you. And then we go over to 
maybe our email client or Facebook or whatever, and we get pop-up ads related to the same thing. You know, so that's that's the use of personal data. Um, sadly, as I said, we, we live in a generation that overly shares stuff. You know, you get people that go to a restaurant, they feel they gotta take pictures of their of their meal and post it, you know, and, and stuff like that. They gotta they gotta overly share on, you know, how they're doing, how they're feeling, where they're going, what they watch, what they read, and yada yada yada. And some of that stuff's okay, but sometimes it gets overboard. You know, and it can be dangerous. You know, if you're on a vacation and you're telling everyone on on social media that you're on vacation, that just opens you up for, oh, hey, this person isn't home. Ah, we can go and steal some from his house. But that's the thing we're dealing with. So, you know, I, I try to make this a little bit more fun. So I try to add a few few cartoons and a little whatnot, whatnot. So I, these are some definitions. This is, comes from a website, uh, basically a blog by the name of uh, Fraud on Fraud. It's run by a guy named David Fraud. He's a security uh, consultant out of uh, the UK, I believe. I uh, really liked his web, I really liked his blog. So, um, so these are some definitions and I think they're useful. So security, again, this is where we're, where we're from. So obviously the, you know, this is kind of like getting from very broad to getting more specific. So security is all aspects of security from physical to logical. So physical is, is you know, hey, you know, physical security of the building, you got cameras, you got, you got guards, you know, fences and whatnot. Logical, that's all the computer stuff we do. More deep, you know, more specific, we have data security or information security where we're, we're protecting data or information in whatever form it's in, whether it's in paper, like you go to a, you go to a company and they've got, masses of paper records, hopefully in a secure room, um, to an electronic form, i.e. on people's laptops and a server room, hopefully in the cloud uh, and so forth. And then of course, cybersecurity, which is more most of us are focused on, which is more protecting that electronic data, whether it's on tapes, whether it's on a floppy drive or uh, USB or in the cloud or what have you. Um, so that's all important. Privacy, I think for some of us, we don't quite, you know, maybe not quite understand it, but here privacy is more of a state of you're not being observed or disturbed by other people. So it's kind of more of a state of mind. But then data privacy or information privacy deals with the proper handling of data. So things like collection, and sometimes we don't even think about this, is that, you know, the collection of data on us is how is that being done? Are they asking us questions or giving us a survey or are they watching what we're buying or they're noting that, hey, this person has bought these things. You know, I see that again, I see this on Amazon, you know, I'll search for certain things or I'll buy certain things. And they'll, they'll like, based upon your prior purchases, we recommend these to you. Um, there's that of consent, you know, did they, did they ask us if they can collect our information, you know, sometimes there is an explicit, you know, ask for consent. Sometimes there's almost an implied idea. And then of course that that use of that data. How are they using that data? Are they using it so they can sell us something, or they are they using it to sell that data to someone else, which is the transfer to the third parties, uh, and so forth. And we're seeing more and more regulations now that are looking at the sort of thing like, you know, how are you collecting this data? How are you using that data? And are you selling that to someone else? And are you, are these people aware of this? And then we get into data, data protection, which is of course is dealing with, you know, the unauthorized use, i.e. using that data about me with my authorization. Have you done that? You know, uh, the corruption of that data, uh, it's loss, you know, Someone has stolen it or what have you, and have that availability. Can I, you're collecting data on me. Can I see that data? Maybe that data is in, incorrect. Maybe you have, you know, maybe I was doing a search, but I don't really interested in that. I was just doing it for something else. Um, so these are all, all important things to consider. And then he did this nice little Venn diagram, um, you know, which shows that, hey, security and privacy, there is an overlap. And I'm seeing a more and more of an overlap there. Um, so where I'm more in the security side, I'm being, you know, as I said, I'm being dealing with more of that privacy side that kind of overlaps with security. And then, because he was more talking about GDPR, you know, he has this little area where like GDPR 
falls in. Um, and then I found this other diagram, which I thought was interesting too, which is you know, again shows the you know the overlap of privacy and security. Security here, they're using the CIA triad: confidentiality, integrity, availability. Hopefully, everyone's familiar with that. Then open privacy again, some of the things I talk about: the collection of that personal information, using it and disclosing it, the quality of that data, and then of course the access. And then of course there is that that overlap, the protection of that information um, that needs to be done. As I said, you know, we're seeing now more and more privacy regulations. Now, there are several, I think most states have some kind of a state regulation regarding it, and we have that in Florida. FIPA is, a, is the Florida Information Privacy Act, but most of these regulations were more around data breach reporting. You know, the, you know, the, a company had a breach of data, what, who they need to, need to report to, how quickly, and so forth, um, but not much more than that. GDPR, which is the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, is a is a EU European Union regulation, and it, and in my opinion, kind of really raised the bar in terms of these privacy regulations. Uh, it's all about giving people more control over their data. There's some other instant kind of there's this concept of the right to be forgotten. Um, this is more about hey you got wrong information about me you need to what you know you need to get rid of that um you know versus like oh you you have you need to wipe out all my data there's also the concept that i'm hearing out more and more is this idea of privacy by design which is kind of interesting because we kind of had the same idea in security this idea of security by design you know don't just you, know, you build a system and then at the end you go oh yeah let's add security you know it's like no 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 when you're building your system let's let's have security from the get-go all the way through kind of the same thing you know build in security all the way through there's also this expectation of conducting what's called a dpia that's a data privacy impact analysis analysis or assessment which is interesting because we have this idea of a business impact assessment uh in you know in or a security risk assessment which is what we've had for a long time and now we talk about okay we need to you need to conduct a privacy impact assessment to understand hey if there was a privacy breach or privacy impact what's that going to affect your business and also having what's called a dpo which is a data privacy officer just like we have a security officer or, or you know like a CISO, there's the concept of having a similar thing over on the privacy side then we have ccpa which is the california consumer privacy act which as some people have referred to as being kind of kind of the first of a of a state level you know gdpr kind of equivalent there's similarities there's differences uh, again it gives data rights to the consumer uh it gives them more rights that you, that you can say no to the selling of your data you can force the deletion of your data and so forth um i think a lot of people are kind of feeling that well with these regulations that we're going to see probably more and more of the states uh, doing this, and I'm saying more and more some companies are worried about this. GDPR is, while it's a European regulation, it's there to protect people of the EU. So even though here we are in the US, we're, you know, we can't say like, oh, we don't care about that. The thing is, is yet when you get companies, organizations that have data from EU citizens, they got to worry about that. Same thing with CCPA, it's about pre protecting people from California. So we may be here in Florida, you might say, oh, I don't care, we're not, you know, California isn't here, yada, yada, yada. But if you got data from people from California and data from people from Europe, you got to worry about this sort of stuff. And I think as more and more states do this, I think more and more we're going to have to kind of worry about these things. Again, another little cartoon I threw in here. I don't always rely on consent to process personal data. But when I do, it's only because I don't meet any other lawful conditions. <laughs> so, okay. And another thing I, I want to throw out is HIPAA, because I do a lot of stuff with HIPAA, and it's kind of had some interesting aspects when it comes to security and privacy. I kind of wanted to throw out, which I think is interesting. Um, you know, HIPAA again, for those who may not be aware, is the it's the federal regulation dealing with with uh, how to protect that medical records in collected by hospitals and doctors, as well as, well as anything that anyone that does work for them that uses that 
So it's interesting they have both a security rule and a privacy rule aspect with, a, with the regulation. The security rule is dealing with the stuff more that we're worried about, i.e. IT security and so forth. And But the privacy rule is there and it's also about the sort of privacy you know, concepts of protecting you know, the use of that medical information and other aspects. Um, one thing we see a lot with, with healthcare organizations, they'll have a set of security policies, which are policies that we as security providers probably, probably would be familiar with. You know, you got a you know, policy about, you know, backups and, you know, setting up the user accounts and network security and yada, yada, yada. But they also have a set of privacy policies, you know, the set down, you know, begin, you know, getting consent to use that data and giving access to it. And one thing with, with healthcare and whatnot is, you know, there is control of, you know, data like, okay, if, if you're sick, you know, you, the doctor can't tell your family members about your condition unless there has been permission in place about it. And then, you know, so what we see in many, you know, healthcare organizations, usually the bigger ones will see both a security officer, which is be basically a CISO and a privacy officer. Yeah, you know, they'll call it a chief privacy officer. And the, you know, whereas the CISO will often be more in the, would be part of the IT organization. The privacy officer is usually part of a uh, compliance organization or compliance aspect. And in some cases, it might be a, a lawyer or a legal counsel for the organization. And before I move on, one thing I, I remembered, you know, I wanted to bring this up was I actually, okay, yeah, um, had a, a interesting aspect with GDPR that uh, I, I learned recently, which is a grandmother was sued under GDPR and was forced, uh, unless she paid penalties, to take down pictures of her grandkids from Facebook. And when I saw that, I was like, what the heck? And then I took a look at it, and you know, there more to, there was actually some more to it. But again, I was like, this is kind of ridiculous. Is it goes to back to that thing of consent? Um, apparently, there's been, I guess, in this family, has been a little. Um, breakdown of the family or what have you, where apparently, you know, the parents aren't too happy with the grandmother or what have you. So because the parents have not apparently given the grandmother consent, she's not, she does not have per their permission to post the pictures of her grandkids on social media. So they they sued her against the GDPR. I mean, I thought it was kind of a bit ridiculous. I'm sorry, but I guess that's why I'm not a lawyer. Because I mean, I'm sorry if I was that judge. I'd say yes, okay, yeah, this this meets the spirit of law, but a lot of law, but not the spirit. But eh, just ridiculous. Okay. So NIST, uh, NIST for those of you who may not be familiar, is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It is a part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. They like to say that they are a non-regulatory group. They do they basically do like standards and measurements, a lot of scientific research, uh, standards and technology, mainly for the use of the government, but because we're paying for it as taxpayers, we have full access to all of the stuff they do, which is really great. I think most of us are familiar with their their, their great, their S, you know, special publication 800 series of works, a lot of them which, which are intended for uh, FISMA, but are still very, very useful for those of us in uh, the InfoSec industry to make use of. Uh, like say 853, which is you know their uh, security and privacy control set, and I think it's 39, which is the risk management framework and things like that, as well as developing the, the NIST uh, CSF. So briefly on the NIST CSF. Um, work started this in back to you in 2013 due to a executive order. They then spent most of 2013 holding a series of five workshops. And these were workshops that basically anyone could come in and attend. Um, they're very, you know, it's one thing I like about NIST is that what they do is very open, that anyone can be involved, you know, or help contribute uh, the things that they're working on. Um, they then, of course, released the first version back in February of 2014, which is now uh, six years later. Um, and then in the following years, they held some more workshops. I actually was able to, uh, to attend the second of these three where we spent a lot of time looking at what the next version of the CSF would be, whether it would be a version one point something or a 2.0 and what it will be, in, be involved in. 
very interesting. You know, it was interesting to attend. Be able to talk to some, you know, as kind of an I view myself as an average person. You know, be able to go to these events and talking to kind of high level people was pretty interesting. Um, then of course, let me see. Uh, in April 2018, they released the version 1.1, and you know we've been going, we're going from that. So the framework has three parts: the core, the tiers, the profile. Core, I think, what most people focus on. That's kind of the controls. You know what you're supposed to put in place for cybersecurity. The profile is a very interesting way of you know aligning you know standards in terms of like you know, okay, where do you currently stand? Where do you want to go to? kind of give you a kind of roadmap of where to build toward and using some industrial standards in terms of, you know, building what you you make use of. Uh, the implementation tiers, I have to be honest, that's one aspect of the framework that a lot of people just don't like. It's a kind of a, what we call a maturity model um, that kind of looks at, you know, how an organization looks at their risk and how they kind of implement it and, and improve things. Um, but I think that a lot of people really like it. I, I know I I don't. So here are some things, and I love this uh, circle logo that they, they developed, which has the five cores, and they do this color coding, which I like. So you have identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Identify is basically understanding what is in your environment in terms of hardware, software, assets, what kind of organization you are, and, and so forth. Protect is to put the measurements in place to protect what you have. Detect is you have something in place that will note and detect you know, what, what's going on. Then if something does happen, you respond to it. So that'd be like your instant response program and so forth. And then recover, that would be, okay, you've had this impact, let's get back up and running. So there's five functions, it's fully divided into 23 categories, and then there's further 106 subcategories, those are the actual controls. And then what they've done is they've had what they call informative references, which they cross map the subcategories to different things such as ISO 27001, which is this, which is a cybersecurity framework um, from an international body. Um, NIST 853, which is the security and privacy controls from FISMA. Uh, COBIT 5, which is another uh, governance framework from ISACA. Um, the critical security controls, but of course they use version five when they wrote this and so forth. <clears throat> They've taken this further to create a whole online catalog of these you know, crosswalks and mappings now. Um, so they have actually now have an updated for COBIT 2019, updated for, you know, they have the uh, uh, critical security row 71 cross mapping and all these others as well. So that makes it really, really good. Uh, the occurs, of course, there's the profiles and then the tiers, which has four tiers with four elements. I'm not gonna get too much into it at this point. So this comprises the cybersecurity framework. And this is important because when they created the privacy framework, they kind of use this as kind of a basic uh, structure for what they did for the privacy framework. So privacy framework is actually, it's been, they actually went through this pretty quickly. I was kind of surprised. They started, they announced it two years ago in September, 2018. They had a workshop and then another request for information shortly thereafter. They then had, a discussion draft and then led to another workshop. Then they did additions to that draft, had a third workshop, and then a preliminary draft, and then they released version 1.0 in January of this year. So basically, a little over a year, they, they created the, this, this first version of the privacy framework. Um, I think they did it much quicker because again, they, I think they used kind of the structure as you'll see of the uh, NIST CSF. Uh, so if you want to see the privacy framework, you can go to the NIST website, they have a whole section for it, download it and take a look at it. Uh, again, just like the CSF, they have a core, they have, they have profiles and they have information tiers, kind of the same way. This is actually a graphic from their present, you know, from the book. Um, and Again, the version is 1.0. Uh, this is the full term, which is a convincing term, a tool for improving privacy through enterprise risk management. So a lot of things they talk about is a lot of is a lot about you know addressing privacy, you know, and looking at the risks of privacy. So similar to the, the CSF, you, there's five functions. It has 18 categories. 
uh, 100 subcategories. Now, one thing that was different is they did not include any informative reference in the framework itself. Uh, they're actually gonna keep that on, on the online site with the expectation that other groups will then submit those informative references, and I hope they will. Uh, then the profiles is part of it, you know, current and function, future, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And again, four, four implementation tiers built on four, four elements, but these are different elements. These are more about privacy. So this is the core functions, the categories and the pattern. And if you paid attention, you will see that they use different colors, which I thought was great, as well as they, they appended each of these function names with a P for privacy. So you have identify, govern, control, communicate, and protect. Um, and I thought that was anything they did, did you know, of course, I don't sure, but hopefully everything's clear. So it's like, identify is kind of a red color, a yellow, a purple, a green, and a blue. And what do we, what do they mean by these things? So, and I, these are actually the term, these they actually take, I took this directly from their phrasing, which eh, is a little clunky, okay. But identify is kind of what you would think, you know, you understand what you have in terms of, you know, your risk for privacy. So it's like, okay, what what kind of data are you collecting? Do you understand the risks for it? You know, how are you, you know, how are you handling it? Govern, um, so governance is might, might be a term that some of us maybe not be too clear on. Uh, this is something more in an organization, it's more your management level in terms of like how they run the company. So here it's about, okay, let's make sure that upper management understands what they need to worry about you know, in, in terms of managing the risk of privacy. Control, which means, okay, that you have the appropriate activities to control and manage that data that you have. Uh, communicate is, are you communicating both within the organization and, and outside, you know, that you understand the risks of, of, da of, of data and you're, that you're handling privacy. And then protect, it means you're, put, again, putting in implementations to protect that data, that's the safeguards. Going a little bit further, these are the subcategories, these are the categories. So identify is kind of clear what you're talking about here. The inventory, okay, what's what's the data that you're collecting? What's your what's the what's the business environment? You know, doing a risk assessment, and then the echo, what they call it what they call it a data processing ecosystem. That's basically this whole environment that is processing data, and then governance. You know, you have governance policies. You know, what's your strategy for risk management? Awareness and training, which I thought was an interesting when I read. read went the next level in terms of like awareness and training. So most of us probably think like, oh yeah, yeah, security awareness, you know, boom, done. Eh, it's a little bit more than that. And then are you monitoring what's going on and, re and reviewing it? And then the next three control, and I thought it was interesting that, that you have data processing policy, you know, and then you have communication policies and you have data protection policies. So a big thing on making sure that you have policies, procedures, and you know, and processes. Uh, communication is also again about making sure you have awareness and protect. I mean, you have things like data security and maintenance and so forth. So, kind of interesting in terms of like what they're looking at. And I noted, you know, informative reference are not in the C and not in the privacy framework itself. Um, so what they're expecting is that uh, different groups will then supply that. Um, so they're saying like, okay, I'd like to see a cross map of. GDPR to the privacy framework, or maybe CCPA. Um, unfortunately, the way that the rules are of, of how they set things up is NIST is like, we're not gonna do that. We need these to come from the organization that creates it and manages it and so forth. So hopefully we'll see coming from California, they will have to then create that cross map of CCPA to the privacy framework. Uh, Health and Human Service, we had to do the same thing for the HIPAA regulations through the privacy framework uh, and so forth. Other other standards, other regulations that would all have to be developed and then they'd all be placed and avail available uh, at the NIST website. So there's been, a, there's been a couple of these things put up but not a whole lot and I think, honestly, I think with the COVID virus and so forth that you know there's not as much being done as I would like to see with the privacy framework um, because people can be kind of like distracted on things. Profiles, profiles again is really kind of an, I think an important aspect is, you know, when people look at any sort of framework, they see all of these controls 
oh, there's 100 or there's 200, depending on what it is, like, oh, I had to impl implement all this in my company and so on and so forth. And that's not that's really not what you're supposed to be doing. You need to be taking a look at these controls and looking at your company and decide what which ones make sense for us. So the idea here with this is you have a current profile and a target profile. Current is basically what you're doing now. Target profile is where you need to go to, and some of it is going to be developed by, you know, you looking at the risks and so forth. Another aspect, which again I think is really important, I saw this with the CSF, is that you had different groups that created profiles for different industries. So if you were in manufacturing, they would create a cybersecurity framework manufacturing profile to say, okay, you're manufacturing, this is what we recommend you have in place. Uh, and they would do it for other ones. So I, what I'm expecting to see with the privacy framework is people coming up with target profiles for like healthcare. So here's the healthcare prof target profile. Here is the retail target profile. And he, you know, here is you know, maybe manufacturing, maybe um, higher education, you know, finance and so forth. So they get some guidance for an organization to say, okay, yeah, here is what an industry body has recommended is what we should be doing in implementing this, this framework. Uh, again, I haven't seen this happen yet, but I hope to see that soon. Implementation tiers, as I said, this, kind of, this is a kind of a maturity model. It's not quite a maturity model. It has four levels, uh, partial risk-informed, repeatable, adaptable. And the idea was this is not that, oh, I need to get to tier four. No, the idea is that you need to go to the level that is makes sense for your organization because getting to higher levels has a cost. Um, you, you definitely do not want to be at tier one. That means that you're you're like not quite doing a good job. Uh, you know, the idea is that you want to be at least at tier two. And if it makes sense for organization, maybe three or four. And it's based upon these different four elements in terms of like how you're doing it. It's kind of a little bit, you know, subjective, which is why I don't really like this. Um, but that is, you, you know, because you kind of have to like read what they talk about and like what's meant by privacy risk and integrated privacy and so forth, and what that means for each of these four, you know, inflation tiers and kind of like figure out, okay, where where do you organization fit, and then kind of figure out how do you, how do you get there. So again, that's why I said, with at least with the CSF, a lot of people just don't like the inflation tiers and don't really use it. So, and there is also, you know, again, a kind of a cross mapping or cross connection between the CSF and the privacy framework. And this is again, taken from them. So I thought this was interesting and that shows that, okay, you've got the privacy risk, which is for the five core uh, functions. And then over here, the cybersecurity risk, which you have all the five you know, uh, core functions of the CSF, where they meet in the middle is the protect P from privacy, but also detect, respond, recover. So what they basically have done is that instead of duplicating these uh, function ID, uh, come, I'd am at that, uh, these controls in the privacy framework, they're basically saying, okay, no, when you're using this, you need to also be pulling this stuff over from the CSF and using it as well. You know, especially when you talk about respond and recover. If you if you something happens in terms of a data breach or whatever for for privacy data, you need to be basically doing what's in the CSF. So I think that's a that's a pretty important thing. Um, and they had this kind of idea, which I thought was going to make kind of more simplistic way of how to implement it. They talked about ready, set, go. Um, which is, a, you know, in the CSF is more of like a seven step process. So that is ready, you kind of, you, again, you identify, you know, what you have, you put your governance in place, and then set, you get your, you figure out what your current profile is, you figure out where you need to go to, so you have an action plan, and then boom, make that make that plan happen. Uh, bits, again, a bit simplistic, but I think it's trying to make, it, make things easier for people. As I said, you know, this is they just released version one, um, and there's a lot of work. So what they've also done, and they did this with the CSF, is they have a roadmap document, which has def has set out these eight items of where they want to go next. Um, 
So they're already kind of thinking forward in terms of like, okay, you know, we've done a lot of work. We got version one. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, things such as, you know, inventorying and mapping, i.e. those cross maps that I talked about. There's worries about emerging tech technologies, you know, IoT and all and bots and all this sort of stuff. You know, working in technical standards, uh, international and regulatory aspects. I think that's a big thing. I thought it. I thought it was very interesting that even when the NIST CSF came out, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, we did the NIST CSF here for the U.S., but a lot of countries around the world were making use of it. Uh, in some cases, they just kind of like. Yeah, we can use this and just use it as is. Uh, other company countries were like, okay, we can take this and we can kind of take some inspiration in how we develop our own. Um, uh, so it's kind of so I kind of expect to see the same thing again with this privacy framework that uh, other countries will like, you know, take it maybe, you know, use it as inspiration for themselves and use it for other stuff. So. So I talked about resources and I wanted to kind of give things, you know, give some ideas for you guys, you know, again, kind of training, certification, organizations, and so forth. So some resources, again, I said, you know, NIST has, has a whole uh, part of their website is focused on the privacy framework. It's, it's like in this, it's a place to go to <clears throat> for the for the framework as so you can download it, download the, the roadmap, access to all kind of resources. Uh, it's just, it's just be kind of, this is just starting. So there's not a whole lot as compared with the cybersecurity framework, but I think it's gonna, it's gonna get there. They also have another project they're working on, which is this whole uh, privacy engineering program. I don't know a whole lot about it, but that's pretty interesting that they're doing this. Uh, then they have, excuse me, another set of, of uh, documents they have, which is called the NIST IR, that's the NIST uh, internal report. And so they actually created this introduction to privacy engineering and risk management in federal systems, again, NIST does a lot of stuff, you know, more to help the federal, you know, government and what it does. But hey, we pay for it, so it's there for us to use as well in, in things we do. And there are other resources um, out there. Um, so as you see, my screen, I actually let me see. So I picked this one up, which is basically a GDPR for Dummies book uh, to help me better understand GDPR. And you know, it's pretty freaking thick. I mean, this is. Uh, about 400 pages long. So I've read bits and pieces of it. Um, I dread having someone do the same thing for, for CCPA and, and so forth. If you wanna really get into privacy and I've been thinking about this, I haven't you know, pulled the trigger. There is actually a whole international association for privacy the IAPP. Um, they actually do have a Florida chapter uh, they offer several certification. They have training, resource, and so forth. Over here is a picture of a book that I got from them um, that's really, really useful. It's, as, it, as you see in the cover, Privacy Law Fundamentals. They do this every two or three years. Um, so I got that. I got some other resources from them. Uh, I've been kind of on the fence where like, okay, do I really want to maybe even join this group? Uh, do I want to think about getting their certifications? I don't know. Um, my main focus is for my education has been more cloud, but privacy has become like, number two after that. Um, uh, so I don't know. They have certifications. These are them. And you can see how complex this is. They have three certifications. Uh, the privacy professional, which is kind of like the person who would be a member of a compliance organization. And because of the different regulations, they actually had to create four different versions. They actually have a fifth, they have to use, which they, they've dropped. They have a privacy technologist, which to me, as the person that would be implementing developing or creating the private you know the the technology aspects of privacy so i would think of it like the c the c cipp person would be like okay, that being like a consultant or maybe a, a part of a compliance organization whereas the technologist i view that as like oh, this is the person who's like this like an engineer type person um, architect type and then they have a manager privacy manager uh, certification uh and again i mentioned david froud uh, he he mentioned that oh, you know he's a security consultant and he felt he needed to get in privacy, so he says he bit the bullet and went joined the AIP AIPP and got all three certifications. Of course, he got the European one, so he's in Europe. So, and then ISACA came out with this in the last couple of months. Um, 
this is supposed to be pronounced Sidipsy. I'm not making that up. Uh, certified Data Privacy Solutions Engineer. Again, that's one of the technologies who would be implementing security. Uh, currently, it's what they call they're in. It's an early adoption mode. I.e., if you can prove that you have done enough within this field, you can get the certification right now. Because unfortunately, they're not doing any testing or training that won't happen until um, early next year. Um, I was, I, I'll be honest, I'm an ISACA member. I wasn't too keen when they did that, did this certification. Uh, I'm still not sure how I feel about it. Uh, they actually did a, did a uh, survey of their members. They made a big deal like, oh, our members said they wanted this, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, really? Because I, I filled out that survey myself and I was like, why are you doing this? There's this other group called IAPP that's doing this. Stay out of this, let them do it. That's, you know, this is their focus. Why are you, so anyway. It is out there. Uh, I'm. I don't know if I'm kind of debating should I pursue this or not. I don't know. So, uh, with that, are there any questions? Uh, I want to do this. I also had pulled up. This is actually the framework itself in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and what's kind of interesting is what they've done is they've actually done some color coding, so to speak in the actual framework they've done two shading they have a dark shading and a kind of a dark gray light gray so the dark is actually a copy from the csf and the gray is kind of like a light gray is kind of like okay it's a modification uh, but this goes through in, in more in depth into like what they're talking about uh, in terms of different things and i said some of the things kind of interesting when you read through it how in depth they get into uh, here here's what i talked about sort of awareness and training you know, we think about, oh, yeah, yeah, security awareness. Okay, but yeah, we talk about, okay, the workforce is trained. The senior executives are trained. You know, your privacy personnel, you know, are trained. And, oh, and your third parties, i.e. your customers, your partners, you know, your service providers, you know, or at least they understand the roles and responsibilities. So it's a bit more to it than you would think in some cases. And they get pretty granular in terms of like what you need to do, as you can see here. Yeah, you know, like here in looking at the data processing, you know, are they reviewed? Are they are you looking at them for alteration and deletion and transmission? Are they being destroyed properly? And so it gets it gets pretty in depth that they what they put through in here. Um, so, but it is kind of interesting, you know, what they have uh, in the framework. So, at this point. Um, are there any questions I had? This is kind of a first one of this presentation. I really love, you know, feedback, especially in the early part in terms of like how I kind of explain as best I can kind of what privacy is and what it's all about. Because I really love to see it. people say, yeah, that was really good. Or like, I, I don't quite understand this. So I need to go back and, and rework it. Hi, Michael. This is Ray. Uh, I just wondered, have you seen any tools that help with this sort of thing when you do any evaluations or? Honestly, not. That's something that's actually yeah, that NIST is looking at is, is is the creation of tools to help out with this. Honestly, I have to be I'd be honest. When I as a, as a as a consultant, I mean, a lot of my tools are honestly like spreadsheets and asking questions and getting evidence and so forth. So, but I hope that you know there's there's other tools that are out there that are more you know maybe you know like you know there'd be like there's like tools that would go out and scan and understand where the data is. Uh, especially when you get into like DLP, data loss pre pre prevention and so forth, where systems are out there going out there and scanning. So where is the, is the data? Do you have PII or PHI in your environment and getting a report and so forth like that? Um, but again, there's because it's a lot of cost in getting these sort of tools. Some groups give, get them, some groups don't. So, and again, hopefully as this sort of, you know, is becoming more mature, that will there, there will be more of these sort of tools out there is what I'm hoping. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Again, I'd love to get feedback on this because, uh, you know, to see what I can do to improve this presentation, um, you know, make, make it better. That was a great presentation, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Oh, there's Daniel. I'll let Daniel close it up. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted. OK. 
Okay. I double muted. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for joining us today. Uh, when I uh, stop the recording here, it'll process in the background uh, and we'll get the link up in the events channel just as quickly as we can. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, one more thing. Uh, in one hour, we're going to have uh, Pacific Hackers container security and then drone security. I have some cool demos for you today. Uh, you're probably going to like it. So uh, we'll see you guys soon. Yeah, right. thanks. I signed up for that. This looks pretty interesting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.